like they can. So, okay, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 2 and we will continue our teaching on <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 2, which talks about the amazing dignity of man, God's purpose for creating man. And we'll kind of review. This is the fourth message. So if you're new and you miss out a little bit, it's okay. Just kind of follow what I'm saying. I'll kind of review it. But um, uh, keep your finger on Hebrews 2 if you can, and then turn also to Hebrews 7. I want to read. This is our main passage here. Hebrews 7, 24. 20, we'll read verse 26 first, and then verse 25. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest as Jesus, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Verse 25, Therefore he, Jesus, is able also to save forever, forever, it's a forever salvation. It's not a salvation you can lose. It's a forever salvation. He's able to say forever. In some translations, and it's a good translation, the King James Version in that particular verse says he's able to save to the uttermost. Those who draw near to God through him. He's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God. Say that. Those who draw near to God. Those who draw near to God. If you draw near to God, God draws near to you. Since Jesus is always living, to pray for that, to make intercession for that. Tremendous verses. Now turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> and we'll read... Um, verse 16, 17, and 18, which we have to complete. For assuredly, Jesus does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of the spiritual children of Abraham, which we are. Therefore, this is an interesting word, he had to be made like his brethren. In all things, so that he might become a merciful and a faithful high priest, in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation or atonement or payment to God's satisfaction for the sins of the people. In verse 18, for well, since he himself was tempted or tested or tried in that which he has suffered, he is able also to come to the help of those who are tested go through the trials of those who are tempted. In verse 10, for it was fitting for him and for whom all things and through whom all things and bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Father, we thank you today. We pray that you really give us an amazing understanding of Jesus' role today for us. May we grow in this teaching message and learn the Bible and may it help us as we relate in our relationship with the living God. Bless, encourage, strengthen in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Before we start, I've got to tell you a story. <clears throat> there was a lawyer and uh, he was driving home one day. You know, lawyers not, are not always, the joke is that lawyers are not always generous people. That may not be true in this room. But I can be safe because I don't think that we have any lawyers here. So anyway, this lawyer was driving home one day and uh, he saw a man as he was driving home. He saw a man by the side of the road and he was, he was eating grass. So he stopped and he he said, what, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And the man said, well, I have no work and I have no food. And this is what I have to do because I'm hungry. 
And the Lord is saying, oh, don't do that. Just come with me. Come to my home. And the man said, uh, sir, you don't understand. I have a wife and five children. He said, oh, that's okay. Just bring them along. They're all welcome to come to my home. And so he go, they go pick up the children and the wife, and they're all driving in the car, and the whole family's so happy. And the wife of the man says, you are such a kind lawyer. Uh, you're so kind to take all of us to your home. And the lawyer said, that's okay. You know, I haven't cut the grass in my house for five weeks. <laughs> now, today, we have a different story. And today, we want to speak from Hebrews chapter 2 about a lawyer that we have in heaven. And thank God he's not like this lawyer. <laughs> thank God the Bible says he's a sympathetic advocate. And he's a high priest for us. And he comes to aid and comes to the help. His name is Jesus. We'll tell you how he came to be a lawyer in heaven. And we'll tell you why do we need a lawyer in heaven. Why do we need a lawyer? <clears throat> what is the meaning of the high priest? How does he pray for us? And how does he ever live to deliver us and save us when we come through difficult situations in our lives? Which often happens. And I'm going to guarantee you that if you get to know this role of Jesus that he's presently playing out in heaven for us, that he's actually actively involved with, it will encourage you. A lot of people in Christianity talk about Jesus, his earthly life, and that we should talk about Jesus' earthly life. But very few people will talk about what Jesus is presently doing today. And there is, in this message, there's four wonderful things that Jesus is doing today in heaven. And we should get to know them. Now, let's understand, let's review a little bit of our message, our teaching series. I like preaching a lot, but sometimes I like to teach because we learn more when we are being teaching than when we're just preaching. So Hebrews chapter 2, let's start from verse 6. The first verse of verse 6 tells us God's original plan. Remember? We talked about that. So David said in Psalm 8, one day, he said, Oh God, what is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You made man a little lower, for a little while, lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, and you appointed him over all the works of your hands. For in subjecting all things to him, you left nothing that is not subject to him. When is he speaking about? David is looking back to Genesis, the first chapter of the Bible, when God created man as the pinnacle of his creation. He created the animals, the plants, the oceans. He created the stars, the moon, the sun. He put these 350 billion galaxies around. Why did he do that? The pinnacle of his creation was you. It was the amazing dignity of man. God said, I love man. Man is someone special to me. He's the highest of creation. He's, he's the center of my universe. He's important to me. Man, little man, you and I, important to God. God made Adam and Eve, put them in the garden. And he put all things under him. Adam would call the animals and, and they would be his pets. He would play with the lions and the bears. And then something happened. We know in verse 8c, man fell. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Satan deceived him man in the garden of Eden. And so we have verse C. But now we do not see all things submitted to man. What do we see today in the world? We see man uh, is a sinner. We, and Adam and Eve sinned in the garden of Eden. The Bible, God told them that uh, uh, if you sin, death will come in the world. Sin will bring death. So when Adam and Eve sinned, God said death will enter the world. And from that day onwards, Progressively, Adam and Eve began to age. Sickness came in. Death came in. And we don't see the animal kingdom became ferocious to protect themselves from sinful man. And no longer is Adam and Eve in control of this environment. They can't control the earthquakes. They cannot control this, uh, natural life. Look at the CNN news every day. Man, Security Council, Syria, problems in the world. Man cannot solve his problems. They just cannot do it. He's trying to do it all, uh, but he cannot. We see man is not in subject to himself. He cannot even control himself. <coughs> and so man will die in sin. And 
man is horribly, horribly scared of dying. I was reading a little article the other day, and it said they actually figured out, I don't know how this will help you from dying, you can't, but that you can, through an internet site, you can send emails even after you die. <laughs> So you load it on this internet site, and then after you're dead in the grave, you can send emails to your loved ones every month. That would be kind of spooky, wouldn't it? Be? <laughs> but you see, but the problem is man knows he's dying. Man is the only person who knows he's dying, but doesn't want to talk about it. You talk about that, then you want to change the subject. Nobody feels comfortable. We were out in the streets on Thursday evening, soul winning, and we had an amazing time talking to people about, about God, the God who can, who's conquered death with Jesus. But we don't see man in control, but we do see somebody. God sent a savior for the world who paid for sin and conquered death. He paid for sin on the cross, conquered death. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus came to be God's savior for the world promised Messiah, the only way to heaven, the real Savior. And this is what he did in verse uh, 9. But we do see Jesus, who was made for a little while longer than, lower than the angels, Jesus because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. And he did this in verse 10, so that he could bring many sons unto glory. So we see Jesus, and this is the whole story of the Gospels, that Jesus left heaven, he left the glory that he had with the Father, and he, he came lower than the angels, which are higher than us, and he entered <clears throat> the human race, and he partook of our flesh and blood, a miracle, Emmanuel, God with us, and he entered in the human race, and he came for one purpose, to taste our death, to die in our place, to be our substitute, and to rise again, and to conquer death, and to give eternal life to anyone who believes in him. And this Jesus did this as one step, the first step, to the major step of bringing sons and daughters to glory. And we see that through the book of Acts, through the Bible, right? We see that in the last chapter of the Bible. Because in the last chapter of the Bible, we see ourselves, us, the saved and the redeemed, brothers and sisters in this room. We know our end. We are saved. We're going to heaven. We're forgiven through the blood of Jesus. And we're going to be in heaven one day. And we see the last chapter of the Bible says, And I saw a new heavens and a new earth. For the former heavens and earth were passed away. And I saw that there was no more curse in this heavens and earth. There was no more sickness, no more dying, no more sorrow, no more tears. Uh, it says that there will be a new Jerusalem city in Revelation 21 verse 9. There will be the glory of God in that heavenly city in Revelations 21, 23. Uh, there will be no more curse in Revelations 22, 3. But we will see the face of God in verse 4. And we will reign with him. His servants will reign with him forever and ever and ever. We will reign with him. That's the great end of the story. And Daniel spoke about it in the Old Testament as John spoke about it in the New Testament. If you read Daniel chapter 7, Verse, and, uh, verse 27, it says that when the Messiah comes, that's his second coming, it says the sovereignty and the dominion uh, of this whole world, the kingdom of this world, will be given to the saints of the Most High God. And that their kingdom will be forever and ever and ever. Daniel knew that this kingdom would be given to the redeemed people when the Messiah comes back, when Jesus comes back. Jesus said that. Uh, you will go to heaven one day. That's for sure if you're a believer in Christ. Yeah, that's for sure. But the Bible also says there will be different degrees of happiness and glory in heaven. That there will be, everybody who goes to heaven will be happy. But there will be some who will hear these words, Well done, my good and faithful servant. They will have crowns and rewards given to them uh, with Jesus. And rulership in the coming kingdom. Oh, I pray this morning, I pray that every one of you, every one in this congregation, that when we're standing in heaven before Jesus' judgment seat and we're going to be revered for rewards, that every single one of you will, will hear these words, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. Well done, Shaman. Well done, Nina. Well done, Ashwin. Well done, Prashant. Well done, Ketan. Well done. Every single one should hear those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. 
all I want you to hear those words. It's going to happen one day. Jesus said, some will rule over five cities, some will rule over ten cities. He said, if you use your ministry, your talents, your time, and invest in the kingdom of God, your giving, your prayers, you will hear the words, well done, my faithful servant. Now, we hear it in verse 9, Jesus came to be our substitute. He tasted death for us. In verse 14, we heard that he became our Satan conqueror, correct? Because Satan had the fear, had the one weapon against us, death. Satan knows that if a man dies in his sins without forgiveness, well, then he's going to go out of God's presence and into godless eternity. But Jesus conquered death. He took away Satan's weapon. Do you understand? He disarmed it. Why? Because he went to death for us. Now I want you to look at verse 10 again. Very interesting verses, and I want you to see something very beautiful. Concentrate and listen, read it. For verse 10, For it was fitting for him, that's God, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. To perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Who's the author of salvation? Jesus. It was fitting for God to perfect the author of their salvation. Why does Jesus need to be perfected? I thought he was perfect. Question for you to ask. Okay. The answer comes in verse 16, 17, and 18. Listen carefully. For surely he does not give help to the angels, but he gives help to the children of Abraham. God told the angels God didn't have a second chance for the angels, friends. The angels were created perfect. The angels were created in a perfectly holy environment. There was not a single sin in the universe. So, when God, they beheld God's glory face to face. So when angels sinned, God said, when you choose Lucifer, you choosing Lucifer, and the sides are selected. There's no salvation for you guys. The second reason the angels couldn't be saved is because angels are not created as a race like the human race where you can have additions. Angels were created as a host. They're fixed in number. Millions and millions of them, but they're fixed in number. You cannot add to the eternal grace. But God made Jesus come, bypass the angels, and come as a man. Why did he do that? He did not give help to the angels, but he gave help to us, the children of Abraham. Now look at the next verse. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren. Therefore who had to be made? Jesus had to be made like his brethren. Notice that we become brethren after the cross, remember? In all things, so that he, Jesus, might be, become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Verse 18. For since he himself, Jesus himself, was tempted or tested in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the help of those who are tested. What does this mean? What does it mean that Jesus had to be perfected through suffering? What does it mean that he had to be made like our brethren to become a faithful and merciful high priest? Let me explain it to you. Let me explain it to you. It simply means this, that Jesus didn't just come as our substitute. He didn't just come as a Satan conqueror. He came to represent us before the Father as a high priest. And in order to be a sympathetic and a merciful, I love those words, merciful high priest and a faithful high priest, he had to experience what you and I experience every day. He was perfectly holy. He was perfectly God. You could not add anything to his attributes. The word perfected through suffering, the word is also used for maturing through suffering. It meant Jesus would grow in his understanding of the humanity of his very creation that he created in an experiential way. It meant that Jesus, would, who was God, perfect God, would come down on this earth, take on a human body, take on human nature, and he would live our lives. He would grow as a baby. 
He would understand what it was to be a baby. He would understand what it was to grow up. He would understand what it was to be an adolescent teen. He would understand what it was to be an adult. That Jesus would taste every experience a human being tastes. That he would sometimes be hungry for 40 days. He would be thirsty at the well. That Jesus would, would, would experience being falsely accused by people, by being lied upon. He would experience being despised and rejected. Could you, can you imagine that? That Jesus would experience, would experience all the emotions of a human being. There were times when he laughed. There was times when he wept at Lazarus's grave. There was times when, when he was righteously angry and he took the scourge and he took the money changes out. Jesus went through every single human experience so that he could represent us. He had to live just like we do, by faith. Do you know that Jesus read the scriptures? Do you know that he prayed to his Father? Do you know that he walked by faith in the Father's plan? Do you know that Jesus saw a man one day who was sick and he sighed? Do you know that one day Jesus looked at a person and he wept tears? Do you know that Jesus went through every temptation that you and I will ever go through, but without sin? Do you know that he went through the temptations more than you will ever go through it? Because oftentimes when we are tempted, we succumb to the temptation. But Jesus would go to the ultimate end of the temptation and see it right through. Why did he do that? when he went to heaven today, you have a man, a God-man who represents you, who understands, who understands your weakness, who understands your dust, who understands your frailty, who understands your home situations, who understands every single situation in your life today. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren, that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest. He had to be perfected through suffering for his role of training to be our high priest. Isn't that good tonight? I want to show you a slide very quickly. I want to show you some slides in the Old Testament, and I'm not going to go into detail right now because we've talked on this subject before. In the Old Testament, there was the tabernacle, remember? I want to show you the role of the Old Testament high priest. Go ahead. This is how they camped. They would camp in the night. It would be a fire by night, the glory of God with the children of Israel. And then the tabernacle had four different parts to it. It had a brazen altar and the outward, the labor, and the holy place and the holy of holies. There was three different parts to it. Do you remember that? And then, go ahead. They would take the lambs, the Old Testament, because Jesus said not yet come to die on a cross for us. The brazen altar represents the cross today for us. It's the outer court of the earth, if you would. And here they would kill the lamb, and the lamb would be slain. And then what would the high priest do? He would take the blood of that lamb. He would go into the holy place where there's the golden stand. It was the showbread and the altar of incense. And he would take that little blood in once a year, only once a year, on a particular day, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. And he would take that blood into the Holy of Holies where the mercy seat was, the two angels looking at the ark where the law was. And the law signified that God's holiness, and it signified God's holiness uh, 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 could not be approached apart from blood. And the angels are looking at the, at the holiness of God. But the high priest would go in, and he would take the blood of that lamb killed in the outer court, representing Jesus himself, and he himself would go in and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat right there. And when the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, it was a beautiful way of saying, judgment rejoices, mercy rejoices over judgment, James 2.13. And this was the innermost courts. And what did this whole furniture of the tabernacle and the temple represent? It represented the very copies of the things that are in heaven, because in Revelation 11.19, it talks about an ark of the covenant in heaven. 
the heavens opened and there's an ark of the covenant and John saw it. There's an altar of incense in heaven. There's a golden labor. There, there's a holy place in heaven. There's a throne of God. And the mercy seat represented the very throne of God. And Jesus was the high priest, if we would. And the high priest would be would be would have a particular garment on. And if you notice that on his chest he had he had these different twelve uh, <coughs> stones on his chest representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and he would go in as a representative of God representing us. And the story is only symbolic in the Old Testament of what Jesus would do as our high priest, as he would go, and Jesus would go into heaven. And in heaven, Jesus, when he died on the earth, he took his blood, he took the blood, the blood that was shed on the cross, he ascended into heaven, and he presented that blood in Hebrews 9.17. He presented it on the mercy seat in heaven. And today there's a mercy seat. When you go to heaven one day, you'll see the mercy seat in heaven where Jesus presented the blood. And that mercy seat, I believe, is in the very throne room of God. And that mercy seat is the basis of why we are forgiven today when we sin. It's the basis. The blood reminds God that judgment will pass over anyone who believes in the blood. Now, I want you to think about it tonight. Listen carefully. A few years ago, a year ago, a close relative of ours died. And I'll never forget that, that, that scene because we were in the hospital while he was dying. It was kind of, he was a believer. But it was kind of interesting because we went into that room and we saw this person half on our back. And he was, he was alive. And then half an hour later, he was gone. The life went out of his body, and we were witnesses of it. Two thousand years ago, when Jesus died, there was witnesses of his death. But three days later, there was five hundred witnesses over a forty year time that saw the risen Jesus Christ. And he ascended into heaven in Acts 1 11. And they were looking up as the apostles saw Jesus ascending to heaven. As we prayed that morning for in the funeral service, I shared with all the loved ones. And I shared with them about how we would see this loved one, Ali, in heaven one day. How do I have the hope? How do I know as I read the scriptures? Could anyone ever see Ollie in heaven? No. But we do know. We do know that somebody was a witness of Jesus in heaven. You see, when Jesus went up in the clouds, he didn't just go up in the clouds and, and was there. But if you read the Bible in Acts chapter 7, verse 56, it says Stephen was being martyred. And when he was being martyred, he saw a vision of the heavens opening up, and he saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. Praise the Lord, our Savior lives. Praise the Lord, he is reached. Praise the Lord, there was a witness of the fact that Jesus is today in heaven. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise the Lord tonight. And what is Jesus doing for us tonight in heaven? What are the things that Jesus is doing tonight? He lived three years or four years on this earth, but he's lived now, he, he lived three or four, 33 years on this earth, but he's now living, he's there for 2,000 years in heaven. What is Jesus doing tonight? The first thing he's doing, and it should excite every believer's heart, is the Bible says he's preparing a place for us in heaven. Let's turn to John chapter 14, because I want to show you something interesting. In John chapter 14, look at these... We read some very familiar passages today. In John 14, verse 2, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. Correct? Yeah. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, the rapture. I will come again and I will receive you to myself. That's the rapture. And 
and that where I am, then you may be also. Jesus was saying, in my Father's house, there are many mansions. And if he was talking about the, what the Bible tells us is the heavenly city, the Bible gives a whole chapter of description about what heaven's like. In Revelation 21, the city is 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, and 1,500 miles high. Thousands and thousands of cubic miles. This beautiful city is called your father's house. The Bible says there's angels there. God is dwelling. Your loved ones are there in heaven. The streets are made of gold. Uh, the Bible talks about the city and the streets and the gates and the beauty of the city. It says the river flows through it. We've spoken about heaven many times. But it says that Jesus is saying here, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house there is many mansions, correct? Yeah. Are you looking forward to those mansions? Yeah. Yeah. But I want to show you something interesting. Who was these verses spoken to? Anybody? Read, read the context. It's very interesting, and I've got a little point that I want to make to you in this message. We'll start reading from chapter 30, verse 36. Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. <laughs> Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? I truly, I say to you, a, a rooster will not crow until, until you deny me three times. Peter is talking to Jesus. The context of John 14, 2 is Peter talking to Jesus. So he said, you can't follow me now, one day you will. Lord, I'll follow you now, die for you. No, you'll deny me. Oh, now listen, by the way, Peter. Peter said, what, I'll deny you? And then he goes to John 14, 1, listen to it. Do not let your heart be troubled, Peter, with that. Yeah, you'll deny me, but I still love you. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, Peter. If it were not so, I told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And what I get from this passage is that this particular passage is being spoken first to Peter. Yes, it is true that in heaven there are many mansions awaiting for all believers. But if you ever thought about this, if Jesus created the new Jerusalem city, from eternity it's been God's throne, God's home, from eternity, then don't you think that he's finished preparing heaven? If he, if he created the universe in one moment, just like that, and created the heavens and the earth in six days, seven days, do you think he requires thousands of years to make the new Jerusalem city ready? I think the city gates are ready. I think the, I think the mansions are ready. I think the river has been flowing for millions of years. I think everything is ready. So what is he talking about? He's saying, Peter, I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to make you a special place in heaven. I'm going to make your mansion just the way you want it. I'll make you a personalized mansion. Do you understand that tonight? How does that sound? What he's simply saying is, Peter, as, you, as I live with you long on the earth, you keep changing your mind about what your mansion needs to be. <laughs> when you were young, you wanted a lot of uh, cricket stuff in your mansions. You wanted a lot of toys in your mansions. When you grow older, now you're thinking, I'd like a little, I'd like a little river, riverside view. I'm going to make a special mansion for you. Because when I get to heaven, guess what? I want my mansion just right. Praise the Lord. I'll be happy with anything that Jesus gives me. But, I, boy, if, if he gave you a choice, what do you think? Well, he already knows the desires of your heart. Isn't he good? Yeah. Maybe I'd like to have mansion. I'd like to have my mansion right next to my loved ones. How's that? I mean, it would be fun meeting Rebecca and Isaac and David and all of them, but I don't know them so well yet. <laughs> 
I would prefer to be with you guys. How about Greater Grace Hall has mansions close by to each other? I don't know how it's going to be. All I can tell you something tonight is Jesus is preparing a place for you tonight. That's the first thing he's doing. Here's the second thing Jesus is doing. He is in heaven and he, praise the Lord, he is the head, the founder, and the CEO of his church. Amen? Thank God none of us are CEOs and heads of churches. Thank God it's Jesus because Jesus builds this church better than anyone can build it. Thank God that since the day of Pentecost, when there was 120 people in that upper room, today there's 1.5 billion people that name the name of Jesus around the world. Thank God tonight there are 700 million born-again Christians tonight all across the world. And that number is, is, is increasing by 70,000 people per day. Thank God tonight 3,500 new churches open up somewhere around this planet in 280 plus countries every week tonight. I think Jesus is doing a great job. Yeah. Hallelujah. I then Jesus is also going to be my lawyer in heaven. He said, why do I need a lawyer? Because you've got a prosecuting attorney. His name is Satan. <laughs> Satan wants to trouble you once in a while. He wants to get into your head and make you feel really down and guilty and depressed and discouraged. And Jesus is your defense attorney in heaven. And he's going to defend you on the basis of that blood that's on the mercy seat in heaven. And I want to show you these scriptures. We're going to go a little slow and just read through it. Return with me to 1 John chapter 2. I started preparing for this message, and it went in a totally different direction than I intended it, but I knew it was the Lord. 1 John chapter 1. Now, these are some of the most important verses that a Christian should know about. They're written for Christians, not for the unbeliever. Verse 5. We read verse 5 to 2.2. 2. 1 John 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him, that's Jesus, and announced to you that God is light. How many can say hallelujah to that? God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. That speaks of sin. There's no darkness at all. God has never thought an unholy thought ever in his life. He's never committed one unholy act. He's perfectly, absolutely, absolutely pure and holy. He's the center of all beauty and holiness in the universe. In him there is no darkness at all. Now if we say that we have a relationship with him, a communion with him, a fellowship with him, and yet we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, and we have fellowship with one another, brothers and sisters. If we walk in the light, and you're walking in the light, and I'm walking in the light, then we have the most awesome, <laughs> highest fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word cleanse is actually would flush out all sins. Absolutely cleanse it. Flush it out. No trace of sin anymore. But if we say we have not sinned, we make him a lie and his word is on us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may, not that you may sin, so that you may not sin. And if, but if anyone sins, we have an advocate, a lawyer with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation. Another word for propitiation is mercy seat. The one in whom God is satisfied for our sins. And not only for ours only, but also for the whole world. Oh, I wish you could understand these verses. It's so beautiful. Somebody will say to us, Pastor, I'm born again. I'm a Christian now. Uh, what happens if I sin? Will I, if I live in sin, will I lose my salvation? 
What do you think? Oh no, oh no, oh no, you will never lose your salvation, my friends. I want to tell you something. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, the Bible says, Now there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Your salvation didn't depend on you. It was a gift from God. It was free. It was based on the blood of Jesus. You were saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. If you didn't earn it, how could you lose it? It was given to you simply by the grace of God. And the Bible says that now that you're saved, nothing, Romans 8, 38 and 39, no, nothing can ever separate you from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. Once you're a child of God, you're a child forever. Once you're born into the family, how can you be unborn? Once your name is written in the book of life, how can you lose your salvation? You can't lose your salvation. But let me give you another warning tonight. If, you, if you're a child of God, you better be careful. Because if you continue in sin, I promise you, you're going to get spanked. <laughs> in Hebrews 12, 5, it says, For God spanks every child that he loves. If you continue in sin and backslide, God will even take you home early. You go to heaven, but you lose all the rewards of heaven. That's the clear teaching of the Bible. I'll prove it to you right, with many, many verses. But I want to say something tonight. There's something else you'll lose on the earth if you live in sin. You lose the sweet, sweet fellowship and the joy and the peace and the love of being with, having fellowship with Jesus. You know, when I'm in fellowship with Jesus, when I'm around Christians, when we're all talking about the Lord, when we're singing His songs, when we're worshiping Him, there's a joy in your heart. There's a joy in your heart. There's a peace that this world just cannot give you. I can try anything else in the world, friend, anything else, I promise you, try it, it will never satisfy you. Alcohol will leave you empty, cigarettes will give you lung cancer, the, the, uh, the relationships will be broken. Some of them, 72 days after you get married, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Cannot satisfy you. Jesus can. He's gone. And he gives us love in our hearts and peace in our hearts and a joy that this world cannot give you. I'd rather spend some time talking to the Lord and enjoying his presence with believers and having fun than fooling around the world. But if I live in sin, I will never lose my union with God, my sonship and daughtership with God, but I will lose my communion with God. Why? Because God's heart is saddened, it's grieved. I will grieve the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 4.30. And I can now restore my fellowship with God only by confessing my sin. <coughs> it's called confession sin. Not for, for salvation, but for family forgiveness. Let's read it again. If I say, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie. I want to say something tonight. If you're living in sin and think you have fellowship with God, I'm sorry, you're deceiving yourself. If a husband doesn't treat his wife right, and I mean right, like a princess, and loves her and cares for her, and talks to her kindly and loves her, he's not right with God. If she doesn't do that to him and loves him, and cares about him, she's not right with God. If you think that you can, you can speak and judge somebody else, if you can assassinate somebody's character, you're not right with God tonight because that's not what Jesus does. If you gossip and you judge and you do that, you're not right with God. If you go out and live in sin and all the things that are apart from God's holiness, you're not right with God. That's what God says. But if you want to be right with God, you confess your sins to Jesus. And you say this, you say this specifically. And you, we should learn to do that. Lord, I'm sorry. I spoke a harsh word to somebody. Lord, I'm sorry. That was not like you. I was unkind. I was irritated, irritable. I was unruly. That was a harsh word. Please forgive me, Lord. This was my sin, and name your sin, and say, Lord, forgive me. And you know what the Bible says? It says at that moment, Jesus in heaven is your advocate, looks at the blood, and he says, Father, Carl just prayed a prayer. And on the basis of the blood that I shed on the cross, his sins are forgiven. I'm his defense attorney. 
And Satan comes up and Satan says, Oh no, but don't you see? He just said. And, and Jesus says, Let me shut up. <laughs> sit down. It's in Zechariah chapter 3. You want it? You don't believe it? Come on, let's, let's turn to Zechariah chapter 3. And we'll read it for a moment. And I want you to be convinced that what, I'm, what we're teaching you tonight is in the Bible. Look at Zechariah. Turn to Zechariah chapter 3. I'll just read it for you and read it at home. In chapter 3, verse 3. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan was standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not Joshua, not a brand plucked out of fire? Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. And the Lord spoke and said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. See, I have taken away your sin from you, Joshua, and I will clothe you with festal robes. Beautiful picture of what happens in heaven. Here you are, you just sinned, you're guilty. Lord, I blew it, I failed. And you're standing there in, your, in spiritually wretched garments, spiritually dirty, you're feeling horrible that you just sinned. And uh, you go to heaven and say, Lord, I forgive you my sins. And the Lord says, right now, I'm cleansing you. Your sin is forgiven. You'll never be brought up in heaven. Your relationship is restored. <laughs> Satan stands up and says, but Lord, you don't see what he just did. Do you see what he just did? Do you see what he just did? Do you see what you just did? And the Lord in heaven rebukes Satan. He says, Satan, don't you understand? I've bought this person from the fire. Pay for with my own blood. I'm clothing you with festival garments. And God sees you that moment you confess your sins and says, You are holy in me. Who can condemn you? <laughs> Romans 8:31. If God is for you, who is it that can condemn you? If God is for you, then who can lay a charge to God's elect chosen ones? If God is for you, then who can accuse you? Who can condemn you? It is Jesus who died. It is Jesus who rose. It is Jesus who is interceding for you at the right hand of the Father. Nay, nothing can separate me from the love of God. For in all these things, I am more than a conqueror to the one who loves me. And I am convinced, Paul says, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor fallen principalities, nor, nor things to come can ever separate. I have a lawyer in heaven, my friend, and, and guess what? He always wins. He's got a 100% track record. You can go to him tonight on the basis of his blood, and he will forgive you every single time. But friends, I tell you something. We should keep short accounts of God. We, we should not. We should be very careful if we want to grow as Christians to let, to let bad words, bad thoughts, uh, when you say them, when you do things, when you are unkind, if you don't confess them and, and say, God, I'm sorry, then you never change because then you just keep doing it and you break your fellowship with God. And in your heart, you have no peace because you're a Christian and the Holy Spirit's inside of you. But you're not having joy with the Lord, fellowship with the Lord, until you say, Lord, change me. Lord, do that. I mean, every one of us. I mean, pastors should do that. I mean, we shouldn't get to the pulpit unless we have kept short accounts with God. Our anointing will be, will be removed when we are not right with Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying tonight? And then we have the final role. I'm getting ready to close. The final role. He is our sympath. He's our high priest in heaven. And the Bible says, let's turn once more in Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> Verse 17, therefore Jesus had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Look at verse chapter 4, verse 15 for a moment. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. 
he sympathizes with us. Not with our weakness and says, okay, it's okay for you to do that. But with the fact that we are weak. Yet he was without sin. And so now, he is tempted in all things. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. First of all, he's a sympathetic high priest. Understand that when you see Jesus on the throne tonight, he understands. He's been through your trials. He's been through your heartaches. He knows the emotions. He's understood pain. He's understood sorrow. He understood death. He, he took your death, the violent death on the cross. He understands what it is for somebody to be in a grave. He understands every single emotion. He is sympathetic. Number two, he's merciful. When you fail, you can run up to the throne of grace to receive mercy. You can actually go into that grace and you can actually visualize in your mind, oh, I failed, but I have a, I have a high priest in heaven, Jesus seated at the right hand, and there in the throne room is a mercy seat. And every time I go up to Jesus and I say, Lord, I forgive me my sins, he turns to the mercy seat and says, Father, on the basis of the blood, he's forgiven. And then he gives me grace to help in time of need. And the last one, he saves me to the uttermost. He's praying for me in heaven. He's the high priest who's praying for me. What is he praying for? Listen, we should cooperate with his prayers. He's praying that we would be one, John 17, 11. He's praying that we would be one. Number two, he's praying that the enemy, the devil, will not be able to hurt us, John 17, 15. Number three, he's praying that we would experience God's love, that the love that I have, Father, in, in us is in them. Number four, he's praying that we would see his glory, John 17, 25, what Jesus prayed on the earth. He's praying when Satan comes to, against you, he's praying for you. And he can save you to the uttermost. I'm going to close with one last story. It's a little long, but I want you to read it and listen. Uh, this is a fantastic story which tells you how Jesus can save you to the uttermost, the uttermost. Here's a story. Danny Volsacco. He was 19 years old. Listen, great story. He was 19 years old when he was already recognized as a top photographer, having his photo shoots of men and women models making the covers of many famous magazines. However, Danny, thrown into the fast lane of fame, fortune, and women, soon became an alcoholic. And then he got addicted to drugs. He was on heroin and cocaine crack. From making $3,000 a day and living in a plush 4,000 square foot apartment in New York City, Danny lost all his contracts because of his drug addiction and he went broke. Due to his drug problem, he lost weight till he was barely 108 pounds skinny, very skinny. And he looked wretched. Soon, unable to pay his mortgage and loans and couldn't face the creditors, he tore up his credit cards. This man over four or five years was now living on the streets. Imagine a man with a $4,000 apartment and uh, rents and huge things. Now he's living on the streets. He's a now a drug addict, wretched, horrible. Often he would find, be found unconscious on the streets, almost dead from an overdose of drugs. <coughs> Danny started, after many years of drug use, Danny started to have mental paranoia. He could constantly hear voices in his head screaming inside of him. He said it was frightening. I would hear these voices. I was losing my mind. Many years before, however, one of the top models who had come to Danny's studio to take photographs was also a Christian. Her name was Wanda. Wanda had known about Danny's drug problem and had witnessed to him about Jesus. Danny had laughed at that time. He knew Wanda was a very fine, nice person, but he had no time for this, as he called it, this God business. Wanda had said something that had stayed with him, however. She had said to him, Danny, the day you call upon the name of Jesus, you will be set free. Now, four years later, Danny Goldsmith found himself in the worst situation of his life. He had been found in a gutter, collapsed under an overdose. He was filthy with vomit all over him. He had these voices screaming in his head. Right there in the Bronx, true story. He was taken up by some medics to a hospital. 
The voices were screaming as he was strapped to the bed. The voices said, go jump out of the hospital window, kill yourself. We know where those voices were coming from, the devil. But he couldn't, he was strapped in. Suddenly he remembered Wanda's words from four years ago. Danny, the day you call upon Jesus, he will set you free. So he did. He didn't have to pray. So he cried in desperation using Wanda's name. He said, Jesus, Wanda said that when I called on your name, you would deliver me. So help me now, O oh God. In his own words, he says, at that moment, Almighty God swept over me and around me. I knew he was real because all the voices in my head suddenly stopped their hellish screaming. And the ball of fear that had been weighing on me lifted. I knew everything had changed then, even now, even though nothing outwardly had changed. I was still lying in my vomit in the hospital bed in the Bronx, but I was a million miles from where I had been before I prayed that prayer. <coughs> that day I called the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he did set me free. Danny Volsaco went from the hospital in the Bronx to a three-month rehabilitation program. In a short time he gained 35 pounds, and step by step his body began to heal. From there, he eventually ended up in a Christian program in upstate New York, where he devoured the Bible like a man ravenous with a new spiritual hunger for God. He loved reading the New Testament because that's where you could, he could get to know this Jesus who had set him free. Today, Danny is an amazing Christian. He's administering with compassion to people in need. He sings in two services in the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. When he drew near to Jesus, God saved him from the guttermost to the uttermost. And I want to tell you something tonight. Jesus can do that for you. Call upon him. He's, a, he's in heaven today. He's a mighty God. He sits on his throne in heaven in all his glory. <coughs> want to say something tonight. If you could hear Jesus praying for you with your name, you would not fear a million enemies. If you could only put you put here, and Jesus was right here, and you could put, hear him talking to Justin's name, or Rajni's name, you could hear what he's praying for you. You would not fear a million enemies. But it makes no difference that he's in heaven because distance means nothing to Jesus. He's God right here. He's a God who helps us. He's a God who saved us, conquered Satan, sanctifies us, sings in the midst of us, <coughs> walks in the midst of us. And friends, all I want you to do when you're in trouble is draw close to him, draw near, draw near to God. You see, that's all he wants you to do. The Bible says he ever lives to pray for those who Oh, yeah, that's all you need to do. When Moses drew near to God, God spoke to him in the burning bush, and Moses' life was changed. When God wanted judge Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham drew near to God, and God spoke his secrets. When the prodigal son was far away from home, so he came to his senses, and the Bible says he drew near to his father's home. And when he drew near to his father's home, what did the father do? The father ran. The father ran. Because if you draw near to God, he draws near to you. And you can get out of every situation, friends. If you find yourselves in situations that are too difficult for you, even situations of your own making, there's a lawyer in heaven who's paid for it all. And you can say, Lord, forgive me. I've been a big mess. Forgive me. And he says, yes, on the basis of my blood, and then you draw near to him. And you say, Lord, give me wisdom in my situation. And step by step, he will take you from the worst situations in your life. And 
bring you to a place of great significance and great promotion. If you humble yourself before God, in due course, He will promote you. There's no question about it. I can stand on the Word of God and realize, yes, He will, no matter what the situation is. Imagine that Jesus knows your name. And imagine that He is praying for you better than you could ever pray for yourself. He knows you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Thank you, Lord. It's true. Nothing can satisfy us in this whole world apart from you. We can try to be the most successful people in the whole world, but without you, our lives are empty. True life, true joy, true peace, true love is found only in Christ. My friend, this morning, maybe you'll come to church for the first time because somebody invited you to come. Maybe you didn't understand every bit of the message. Maybe some of it went in your head, but tonight you can do something in your heart. You can ask Jesus to come into your heart. Like Danny Balsaco, you can accept him and call upon the name of the Lord enjoy the presence of God like you never understood. God loves you. He knows about you. That's why you came here. He wants to have a relationship with you, a friendship, just like a father with a child. Because we are sinners, he sent Jesus to pay for our sins. Jesus didn't die by accident on the cross. That was the plan of the Father. Thousands of years before he came, the prophets told us that Christ will come and die on a cross to be the Savior's sacrifice, to pay for the sin of the world. He could pay for it because he was holy, he was God. You and I cannot pay for each other's sins, but Jesus showed his love by dying for you. He rose again. He promised eternal life to anyone who believes in him. You can be in heaven one day. You can know when this life is over. You don't have to worry about losing your possessions. Everything you have on this earth will one day be lost anyway. But you can gain eternal life, an eternal home, an eternal Father in heaven, an eternal love like you have never experienced in your whole life. Say this little prayer with me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I want to know your love. Thank you for being a friend to me. Thank you that you love me so much. You, you left heaven and came on this earth. You died on the cross to pay for my sins. Because you rose again from the grave. And no one else has ever done that. I know that those who believe in you, you promised to rise again. They would be in heaven with you. Thank you today. I heard that you got a mansion for me that the creator of this universe, the God of the whole universe, made the sun, the moon, the stars, the oceans, the Niagara Falls, if he made earth so beautiful, then how much more must heaven be? So, so much more beautiful. What a creative God we have. He's making a home for us in heaven. Oh, I can't wait to go there. Say, Jesus, forgive me my sins. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Forgive me and save me and take me to heaven one day. And from today, friends, if you pray that prayer in your heart, I promise you, go get a New Testament. Get a, get a little portion of the Bible. And start reading about what Jesus spoke, his miracles, his life, his story. It's the most powerful story that has changed lives across this earth. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the service. Bless the worship now as we close. And to you be all the praise.